So I guess I need to tell you what Space Architect does and why it almost forces him or she to be an optimist. So maybe we should start with some basics. Um, space Architect, uh, well, the main goal of the Space Architect is to design an artificial habitat beyond Earth for humans. So um, this will be, this is very, for clarification, you have, uh, well, uh, here a word, a habitat. It's a very important word for our talk, so please learn. And uh, this is a definition for a natural habitat, not the artificial one. So now, why does the dream and the goal to design artificial habitat beyond Earth make space architect an optimist in the world that doesn't exactly encourage you to be one? Well, almost every day in social media, you can see in your news feed that there is some kind of world-ending event, and most of it, it's, it's fake news, probably. It's very hard to distinguish uh, truth from a lie, unless you have very good source. Um, for example, um, human-made climate change is real. We know that because we are sending satellites for over 60 years, and uh, scientists are pretty good at analyzing data, providing us with proofs. So we know that human-made climate change is a problem. So space architect also needs to be a scientist. He needs to make his research, he needs to uh, analyze his data, and then uh, conduct studies and implement them into real life. So that also means that he's a designer. And that makes everything a lot more difficult because uh, the designer and the work of the designer is a lot more elusive. It means a lot of uh, trials and errors. Um, it also means a lot of project management skills. Normally, architects need to deal with their team, their investor, contractors, civil engineers, um, city of, um, officials in order to build a house. Uh, in the case of space architect, you need to speak with scientists and engineers, like, you know, a lot of them, since um, designing a space habitat beyond Earth Safe space habitat is really not an easy task. Um, and we build one habitat here on Earth. Um, it's an analog habitat. Space architects do that to test a lot of things that could go wrong in space here on Earth. Um, the habitat is called Lunaris. It's located here in Poland. We built it last year, and we are still developing it uh, year after year. And its main purpose is, is to isolate teams of scientists uh, and see how they operate and how they live with, with each other in isolation. So this facility helps us understand how uh, and provide isolation studies. It, this facility helps us with human factor studies. But also we are testing some technologies like uh, artificial day-night cycle, the technology that could help us endure, uh, endure long uh, isolation in a spacecraft or uh, in uh, base on the Moon or Mars. We are also planning to provide enough energy for the facility and store it efficiently. And, uh, and again, we would like to well, produce food for the astronauts. Uh, while, uh, when, while we are building the Lunaris habitat, I've met Dr. Christiane Hennicke. Uh, she's a veteran of isolation studies. She spent one year in high seas habitat in Hawaii. She was isolated on the volcano. And now she is a leader of the project to develop um, another habitat. But this time, it's a technical prototype. It's called Moon and Mars Base Analog, or MAMBA for short. And it will, and it will no, be in the form of pressurized vessel. And it will uh, have, like, biological life support system, so it will re uh, renew our water, our oxygen. It's also a great place to design the best geological and biological lab, and this is what I am currently doing with uh, Christiane. Um, at the same time, other scientists are trying to make their best to shield future astronauts from radiation shielding. That is, well, well <laughs> rather a big issue when, you, when it comes to space travel. But this is a technological 
prototype. So when we build it, in theory, we could send it to the moon and, well, have a base there. But still, it's still a prototype. The last project that we are currently involved in is MAX, or Martian Agriculture Experiment, that we are planning to build in Australia. This is something different altogether. This is the first time that someone will try to build an analog of a colony. So it will provide us... Uh, so we could make sociological studies for, uh, with people, with a group of people that will be around 16 or 20. And in that case, you, you don't want to bring all your architecture with you from Earth. You would like to develop it on site. So probably all the structure will be 3D printed using local resources. So it's, it's called in-situ resources utilization. Um, so yeah, this is how you you would like to construct your small village from things you have on your landing site. But inside, you would like to feed all your people. So inside, we'll uh, conduct large-scale pro food production studies. And at the same time, under the dome, we would like to create simulation of a biome to make this habitat more Earth-like. OK, that all sound probably quite impressive and quite exciting. Uh, three different projects, three different aspects, but it wasn't always like that for us, to be honest. Back in 2013, when I was trying to gather my team of scientists and engineers, I well, came back to my university, Wrocław University of Science and Technology, and I've met my first teammate, Dorota. Back then, she was a student, but she already created several uh, student Martian rovers for different competitions. Very skilled mechanical engineer. She said yes, and soon after, I've met more of them, more scientists, more um, engineers, not only engineers, as you can see, maybe you recognize some people here uh, from today. Um, but with those people, I was able to try to design our very first space missions. Uh, we decided to participate in Inspiration Mars Student Design Contest. It was 2013, uh, end of 2013 and we had to design the full mission architecture. So we had to design trajectory to fly to Mars and back, um, find the right, uh, right rockets. We had to design radiation shielding, life support system for the crew, and provide them with enough energy. And this is what we did. We designed the spacecraft. It was quite cozy. That's why we got to the finals. We were invited to present our big report. It was like 60 pages or so. Uh, in Houston, before professionals, this also when we made some buzz around us. So I met my very first TED talk then, uh, four years ago. Huh. It was fun back then. Well, today is also fun, really. Um, and then we went to Houston to present our uh, our project. It was really, really exciting. This was the first time we were, well, experiencing uh, such emotions and we failed. Um, that was devastating because I thought that I lost my once and only chance to be a part of space industry. But it, well, it, it worked out in the end since um, I was invited by Ministry of Economy to show our next uh, idea during Expo 2015 in Milan. We, I created uh, well, a concept of inflatable uh, Martian colony together with our partners. And it went well. It, it, it involves inflatable structures, robotic assembly, uh, life support systems. So I learned something from out of it. And I was quite proud. It was nice. It was just nice. So nice that we decided to do another competition. This time, it was NASA 3D Printed Habitat Challenge. Uh, that, and teams were introduced to the problem how to construct architecture beyond Earth using only robots and local materials. So obviously, this. Um, Competition involves 3D printing technologies, robotic assembly, uh, in-situ resources utilization, and combining those three uh, also meant creating a right radiation protection for the astronauts. Once again, we went to, well, we got to the finals. We went to New York to present our um, concept. Uh, and we lost once again. Um, but this time, we lost to some very good teams, like European Space Agency team or Foster and Partners team. So that was quite nice to lose to, lose to some professionals at this time.
Ah, yes, and then we um, participated in the ESA Moon Challenge in 2015. Together, we were part of the bigger team called Hecate. It was an international team, uh, well, from all around the world, researchers, young, young researchers that we've met. And guess what? Uh, okay, the mission involved mission architecture of teleoperations. So, uh, using robots from greater distance, you can use VR uh, in the, uh, during, uh, well, during um, breaks. So, you can also play with that. And there was also robotic assembly involved. This time we've won, thankfully. And that's why we're uh, invited to participate in Mars uh, initiative. Mars Initiative was to create po the first Polish analog habitat. Mars stands for Martian no, Modular... Um, what does... Um, yeah. Okay. Don't worry about it. The thing is, we designed it, we were building it, building it, and the project had some problems, so it was put on hold, so we can count it as failed. Uh, at some point. But hey, there were another competitions like Gemini Mars, where we once again had to design mission architecture that could take us from Earth to Mars and back. Yeah, that's how it went. Um, and then Phobos based design concept. Uh, it was last year, it was 2017, when uh, out of well, like, quite a big team was working on this report, quite big report, because our task was to design a base on uh, moon, uh, Mars moon Phobos, which is basically a big asteroid, and we had to design, well, provide energy for astronauts. We had to produce enough food for 12 astronauts for over a year. It involved using inflatable modules. We had to shield them from radiation, use uh, in-situ resources, assemble the base robotically, and yeah, it also involved asteroid mining since Phobos itself is just a big asteroid. It was really, really massive report. Uh, but we failed due to some formal reasons uh, when it comes to formatting the document. So we had a lot of very good uh, material for scientific papers that we uh, well, created and presented in Australia. This is how we've met our partners for Max Habitat. What else? Okay, this very interesting chart. Um, it shows how much failure you need to endure in order to <laughs> succeed at one point. It's good to know that every single failure that, you, that we cre we, we've done, that we had, was a little bit higher in professionalism than the last one. And this is remarkable how much our team developed. So Dorota, for example. Um, Dorota was our analog astronaut in Lunares. But also, she started her own design team back in 2016, I guess, and flew her experiment to space last year. It was a space drilling experiment. She, and they took a drill and a rock sample, and they drilled in microgravity. Um, it was, uh, this experiment involved, no, was created with asteroid mining uh, in mind. And now Dorota is working in European Astronaut Center, flying with astronauts on zero-g flights, and she also designs tools uh, for future missions on Moon. How cool is that? Alec is now leading the project on, on Vrosov University of Technology and Science that will send another experiment into space ne ne next year. And this time, it's not a, it's not a drilling experiment, but it's a gripping tool, so we'll try to catch an asteroid one day. Now we'll try to catch something inside the rocket. But either way, once again, uh, asteroid mining is involved uh, in his studies. Uh, my friend Shimon became one of the best science educators, uh, educators that, that are well, in Poland currently. Asha and Anya that help us with uh, Phobos Base are now developing with us prototypes of uh, vertical farms that will be installed in Lunares and also in Max Habitat uh, Well, when it's finished. Uh, our second archi architect, Agatha, is dealing with shell structures, so she's trying to simulate structure that will be finally 3D printed also when we try to 
finish max habitat. So yes, and now we are back here. Now you know how we gathered enough experience to deal with those things, but also now you know that there will be some speed bumps along the way, probably, uh, with the realization, on the realization of all of those uh, projects. And that's very good news, because this is exactly what Space Architect needs to do. Make every single mistake here on Earth be before you send anyone into space. Now you know some basics, so basic assumptions about space architecture. You know that it involves a lot of isolation studies, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, human-related studies. You know that it is about technology that could build your future homes, that could protect you from outside environment. But also it's about creating artificial biomes, life support system that could replenish your water and oxygen. It's about creating artificial day and night cycles. And now I should probably show you how to implement those aspects beyond Earth, shouldn't I? Um, we've spoken about Moon, we've spoken about Mars, but we also spoken about, uh, spoke about asteroid mining. So I will show you how to build a, uh, an artificial habitat inside an asteroid. Well, first you will need to mine it. You need to uh, leave it hollow inside and then you would like to spin it uh, 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 along the longer axis, creating centrifugal force. It will create some kind of uh, artificial gravity for you. Then you put your pressure inside, your oxygen, your water, your life support. You create your ideal artificial biome. You put well, artificial day-night cycle inside. You order robots to build your cottage near the lake that you really like. And that will also serve as your blue sky, since the curvature of the, the asteroid. OK, that looks quite idyllic. Uh, let's call this habitat B612, because of reasons. And now you know my plans for retirement in 60 years or so. And I strongly believe that this is where all these technologies could bring us. And this. Well, and being serious, this is our future. Because if we could create that kind of artificial habitat, if, you can, if we can sustain it, if we can control it, we could well, extrapolate a bit. Because every uh, innovation that we are developing for space architecture will come back and we could use it on Earth, providing cleaner cities, healthier cities, that could, uh, we could help ourselves with waste management, with food production. We could uh, basically um, make our world, uh, I'm finishing, yeah, um, would make our world a better place. And this is all because of these technologies and these scientists that I'm working with, remarkable, rem remarkable people, um, that I'm, and I'm seeing their motivation, I'm seeing their passion, and I, well, I just witnessed how a single person can uh, change a world for a better uh, place, and this is why I, str oh, I believe that this is exactly what will happen. This is why I, as a space architect, am an optimist. Thank you very much. <laughs>